Good morning, everyone. So uh, yesterday at the plenary, you guys heard us talk about architecture as one of the five themes that we're going to focus on this year. And you saw this slide, right, where we talked about managing legacy, enhancing, enabling our platform, and looking and leaping towards the future. Um, today's talk um, is going to focus on the middle, right, the platform. And I wanted to say that this talk, it might seem, sound a little bit academic. It's going to talk about the design mindset that we have behind the things that we are going to do in, in the future. So the APIs, right? What's, how are we going to design it? The back end, front end split. What is our mindset? How are we thinking about that? Django app plugins. You guys may have heard about that as well. What is, our, what is our strategy behind it? Microservices, where do we draw the lines? Building, build versus buy decisions that we make. So um, it's not going to be, this talk isn't going to be specifically about the technologies that we're using or specifically you know, what, what the implementations are. That would be a, a different talk and you're very welcome to talk to any of us from the edX team more about those details and also in open edX proposals, you'll see more of those details. But this is to give us more about how we wanna go thinking forward about being intentional about our architecture, what are the design principles, the solid principles that we want to use, domain-driven design as a way of determining what the boundaries are. And then I'm going to talk about more about how we're thinking about phasing this in into our ongoing development, talking about a contextual context maturity model, also um, you know, integrating this with legacy systems that exist. So we're going to drive by this very quickly. There's a lot to cover. Uh, so let's get started. So let's start with intentional architecture. With agile development, right, we've, we've been thinking about we want to we have autonomous teams where they can move very quickly, right? They want to be immediate with their development, incremental. And if you think about it as emergent designs that, that develop with agile development, but there are cons with that approach. If, if you're only thinking that way of the, for individual teams and moving them forward, then those, that, could be, that could have a more narrow-minded mindset of what actually gets developed, and it could be inconsistent across your system. So if you can balance that with an intentional architecture, intentional mindset that is more purposeful, more planned, right? And there would be more governance is a downside, but also an advantage, because then you can have more consistency and so forth. This is a standpoint that we have right now at edX, where we realize that we maybe have focused too much on emergent, but we need to now balance it with the intentional. And this will hope, help uh, with time to value within edX, as well as the open edX community. So what we're going to do is because of that mindset, right, we're now going to talk about design principles that we're going to use for the work that we're going to be developing. So let's start with, um, so solid principles. How many of you guys have heard of solid design principles before? Okay, so a few of you have, a few of you haven't. We're, once again, I'm going to drive by this very quickly. So, but there's a lot of resources out in the internet for this. This is really to just give you guys a taste of it. And hopefully, as students of architecture here, you'll go out and, and read more about this. So without principles, without these, this mindset, what ends up happening is we have no boundaries, and we then have this ball of mud where things are integrated with each other, there's a lot of tight coupling, and it's really hard to make sense of what's where. If I need to make a change, I make a change in one place, oh wait, no, now it causes ripple effects downstream here, which I had no idea. Even our tests are really hard to understand, and this is where things have become. Um, and if we don't do more of our intentional design and mindset, then it will continue to evolve further in that way. So let's use SOLID. SOLID, S, stands for Single Responsibility Principle. So to take an analogy here from the automobile industry, right? you have different parts of the car, of an auto engine, which have different particular responsibilities. And it's very clear what each one would be doing. So you have the engine, you can have the exhaust system, you can have the brake system, and so forth. And um, each one is, has its own boundary. It's, kind of, it's very clear of what each one is doing. 
So what does um, S stand for? Single responsibility principle. So taking that now into our platform, if it's very clear what the core of the, your system is, and then you have an application layer, and then you have all other details around it, and there's clear linea 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 lineage and lineation between, delineation, sorry, between each of those boundaries, then it becomes clear what each one is responsible for. And with single responsibility principle, what they say is if you can draw those li lines around the axis of change, then if one thing needs to change at a different rate than another thing, then, then there, you know, it allows that uh, more decoupling from there. So the single responsibility principle, read more about it as well, and that, that mindset will allow us to have a better understanding of what those boundaries are. O, O stands for open close principle. You want to be able to th design a system that is closed for modification but open for extensions. So our analogy with the auto, you know, you, if you want to have a comfort package with heated seats or a driver confidence package with you know, rear park assistance, uh, these are things that are not, you don't have to modify the core of the car to add those packages. You don't have to go back to the dealership and the manufacturer to say this. These are things that they could, you know, to, um, to, to add to the car. So you can extend the car that way. So O stands for open close principle. And from that perspective, how do we extend our platform? What are those extensions? Can we add new stuff without modifying the old, right? So technology-wise, right, you have APIs that you can then call and you can add those new features that would then just call those APIs. You can have an eventing system so that will notify you know, anyone who is interested so that you can, you know, once again, add new features that are interested in certain events um, and without needing to modify the core. So if you notice that, right, we've added at the application layer, not the core middle, but in the application layer, which is gluing things together, you can add more green boxes, those features um, around it. D, now D is a little bit tricky, but it's so important actually. Uh, so D stands for dependency and version principle. And so if you think about the car and all these different add-ons, right, that you can uh, specify. And do I, is it the car that is calling out to, you know, any of these individual things? It's, it's not, it's actually these, these individual add-ons are just, are just basically adding to the car, right? So there is a dependency from those add-ons to the car. It's not the car that is dependent on those plugins. So dependency inversion principle is very important. You want your dependency to be in the direction of the stable part of your system, right? So here, for instance, the email, emailing system and the proctoring system, you want those arrows to be in the reverse direction. You want them to be uh, pointing inward. You don't want the core of your system or the application layer to point outward. Why? Because then if you need to make any changes, you also then need to modify the core. We actually want to be able to go ahead and modify those things out in the perimeter and let them change at their own rate, right, without needing to change the core. So um, plugins and Django app plugins, what we've developed so over the last year, it's all based on, on, on this dependency inversion principle. And I, so the next two, I and L, it's, a, it's not in the order of solid, but um, I and L talk a little bit more about those APIs and how you would design those APIs. So I stands for interfa interface segregation principle. And the example I came up here with was if, you know, when I, when I wanted to get the driver confidence package with rear park assistance so that I don't get scratches on my car and stuff when I try to park. Um, but in order to get that, I needed to get leather seats. They didn't allow me to, I had to upgrade to a model. So basically as a consumer of their car and as an inter, you know, as of their interface, I needed to get more stuff than I really needed. And you know, when you're designing APIs, you know, think about that in mind. So don't 
give more than what the consumer needs. Maybe you have, if, if the mobile app doesn't need all those fields, and is there a way that they can request a subset of it? Um, or, you know, so that's interface segregation principle. And minimize the dependencies. All the people who are calling those APIs minimize the amount of dependencies that they need to make uh, to, uh, to, 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 the, to the interface. So, and then the last one is Liskov substitution principle. And basically what that is about is allowing you to replace things. So if I wasn't able to get that package from, from the car dealership, but if there was a third party package that allows me to do, do get that parking rear assistance, then you know, if it's a plug and play thing, it's very easy to go ahead and substitute and replace. So what does L stand for? This is a bonus question, it's a tricky one. Liskov substitution principle. Barbara, Barbara Liskov, she was, she was a professor at MIT, so she came up with this. So, um, And the advantage to this, so for instance, you have a proctoring interface. Now you can go ahead and quickly substitute for Xfinity and Software Secure or email, whether you go from sales through MailChimp. If an open edX instance doesn't want to use one thing that ed, you know, edX.org uses, it's very, it's, it'll be easier for them to substitute. And it allows us to avoid if statements if you, if you follow this principle. You don't have to, within the proctoring interface or within application layer, say, hey, look, if it's Xfinity, do this. If it's Software Secure, do this. You know, if you have an interface that can do a plug and play model, then, then these types of things can be avoided. So that's solid in a nutshell. Once again, we drove through that very quickly. But, but these are the types of things that we've been now starting to talk about within edX. And it'll be great if the open edX community um, you know, gives us feedback on this and, and also comes on, 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 on ball. Now, thinking about this at scale, right? How, how is this going to work? Are we going to apply solid everywhere and to what extent? So not necessarily. There might be some things that are core to the system. You want to make sure that those are very crisp, those are very clearly designed, and um, you want to make sure that there you do have those boundaries and you are following the solid principles. So those are the core things on top. But there might be some other things that are more generic to the platform or supporting. They're not, in terms of business use cases, they don't necessarily need to be as clean, but you want you want people to move quickly as developers. And so there might be a different, it's okay maybe sometimes if, the, if you do have a big a ball of mud, for instance, for, for a supporting layer. So um, those are things that uh, you, know, you would need to think to consider. And then there could be a, what's what domain-driven design calls an anti-corruption layer between these types of uh, boundaries, between these types of contexts. So let me talk a little bit more about domain-driven design just to, give you guys a little bit of perspective on that. Domain-driven design allows us to think from the business use case perspective, provides us a way to have a common language that we use, and also lets us think, so think about where to draw the boundaries based on the life cycle of, uh, of, of the uses of, of, your, of your context, as they call it. So from so at edX, we took a stab at what those larger contexts, what, what domain-driven design calls subdomains uh, in, in the edX platform. So from, we, we thought about it from, these, uh, from this perspective, and we, we drew these five different subdomains. So there's authoring and learning, which we're considering as very core to the platform. And then we have analytics, right, and catalog discovery, which are more supporting. And then there's credentials, where at this time, right now, we're thinking of as generic. Now, whether something is core versus supporting versus generic might change over time, depending on um, you know, what, what, where we want to invest. But um, at this time, this is how we're viewing it. And it allows us to then, because we have limited resources, because we have such a large system that's going, that, that is there, allows us to figure out where to focus our efforts and where, which things are okay to buy versus build, which things are okay to, um, to maybe not spend as much time in refactoring and making very, very clean. So, and here's another perspective of the relationships between those subdomains. And there too, with domain-driven design, where we're thinking about it from the, from the perspective of life cycles, right? We can think about, okay, well, you're authoring content. 
and then you can publish it to a catalog discovery, right? And then for, for and, and when you're authoring content, you also publish learning content to the learning system. And then learning can go and read things from discovery. And as a user of our system, you can go from one subdomain to another and, and, and to another. You don't have, and then it's very kind of clear from the business perspective of how one goes from one subdomain to another. Now contrast this to something where we don't think about it from the perspective of domain-driven design. Then what ends up happening is that as technologists, we think about, well, the data. And, well, you have catalog content. And, well, everything needs catalog content. And so we're just going to go ahead and have the LMS read and write to it and studio read and write to it and e-commerce and analytics and whatever. And then now you have a tight coupling perspective, right? And so this is an anti-pattern which is called entity-based services. Domain-driven design allows us to not have this. And we have actually implemented it this way currently in our edX platform and that's causing issues in production for us because we have this single point of failure. When one service goes down, then another service goes down. And so this is, if we continue to go along this way um, with, you know, without having that intentional architecture mindset, then this is not gonna scale for us. So if we now instead apply domain-driven design, then we can think about it once again from the perspective of life cycles. Well, when you're authoring, that's the only place that you really need to edit your catalog content. And then you can then go ahead and publish it to the catalog content context. And everyone then can read it. And so now there's a single data flow throughout our context. And now, instead of there being solid arrows, right, back and forth, now there could be dashed lines. Now there could be asynchronous relationships. And there doesn't have to be like when someone is in the learning you know, context and that becomes a microservice, right? They don't need to worry about catalog content going down and now learning also, um, you know, when, when, when students are accessing the LMS, you know, that also crashes and goes down and whatnot. So, um, so this is why domain-driven design allows us to think about these relationships between the contexts. Now, the other thing that might be a you know, knee-jerk reaction of what, no, no, this, is, this doesn't make sense from the engineering perspective, but like, is this thing about data duplication. And you know, we, we as engineers think about dry and do not repeat yourself as a, one of our core tenets. However, when you're thinking about now across microservices and across these larger boundaries, data duplication is not necessarily a bad thing. And um, you know, the, the uh, consistent, the CAP theorem with consistency, availability, and partitioning, um, you know, you there's a trade-off that you have to make. And um, if, you, if you're very focused on consistency and we wanna make sure there's only one place where something is stored, right, like, like in this case, then, then um, what happens is, like I said, availability trade-off happens and things crash because there's now only one place that you need to go to. So, but instead, if you do have data duplication, there are some advantages. Now, each one, each context is its own self-contained system. So analytics or learning credentials, they have their own copy of the catalog content from the perspective of what they need for their own use cases and they don't need to rely on, the, on a different context. And so this way, each one can continue to uh, uh, survive without the other one. So it might be contrary to what, we're, what we've been thinking so far, but there's, um, uh, we talked about this last year with Reactive Manifesto, but these are design principles that we're thinking going forward. So I'm going to now switch context a little bit and talk about a possible way of phasing all of this uh, into our current system. Because you might hear all this and think, hey, wait, wait, are we gonna like re-implement everything? Well, no, we have five years of legacy uh, code in our system and it's you know, functional as it is, but we wanna move towards this for future scalability. So from that perspective, here's a proposal that we have of a bounded context maturity model 
where you, know, you start. So I'm going to go through actually each of these uh, now, but just to give you this higher perspective of where you have no boundaries with the ball of mud, then you start having logical boundaries to some, and then finally physical boundaries. With logical boundaries, it's still easy to cheat, right? You, you, you could still make calls when you're not supposed to. With physical boundaries, it becomes uh, much harder to do that. So, and by physical boundaries, we're talking about microservices. With logical boundaries, we're talking about within a process, uh, but, um, but still there are some sort of lines there. And once again, no boundaries is the ball of mud. So, um, ball of mud. So, as we said, there are, no, there are no principles necessarily, no boundaries, and so in terms of dependencies, you have dependencies at the code level, at the runtime level, deployment, data, APIs. There's a lot of interdependencies between each different, different part of the system. So instead, if we now start thinking about plugins, now you have also clear, cleaner interfaces, then the plugin, using the dependency inversion principle, is now going to be able to be an external thing that can then call into a, a, a system. And whether that system is a legacy system or a new system, whatever, but you have clearly defined interfaces that the plugin can call into. But there is still code dependencies, though, because a plugin needs to call a Python API or some API in, in the system. So something to consider. But once again, now here, the plugin depends on the core. You don't have the core part depending on the plugin, and so there is an advantage still to this, this model. Then, if plugins, though, use signals as a way of communicating instead of interfaces, it becomes actually even better in terms of decoupling. Because now there's no code dependencies. A plugin could theoretically have its own duplicated data even. It could be very self-contained. Uh, it could be in its own repo. And the relationship between the core is uh, just an asynchronous communication, or, or maybe synchronous actually in this case, uh, using Django signals, right? And so this, this has a lot of advantages there is uh, over the previous one. So once again, previous one, you're calling, like there's a solid arrow, right? So you're calling, there's a harder dependency. This one, there's dash, dash dependencies. Uh, and so um, they're, they're, they're even more decoupled. Now, if you t talk about, think about microservices, microservices are now physical boundaries. So you want to still, so we want to still, because of what we talked about, like in terms of DDD and asynchronous, still have dashed arrows. You want to still have asynchronous dependencies between microservices. And um, once you do that, and they're, now they're physical boundaries, you can independently deploy them. There are no runtime dependencies. They, don't, they will each have their own data storage. And communication between them, right, you, you, they would be asynchronous. You can use REST. You can use message queues and so forth. And in terms of back-end, front-end split as well, right, this is this design pattern where you now have a front-end that is now communicating with the microservices via APIs. And another, uh, in terms of the context maturity model, an even better approach is if you can do anything further for decoupling, right? So instead of having uh, um, uh, APIs that you ca communicate with each other, if, if, you, if you can use uh, eventing, then one microservice can just publish their events and other, micro, other microservices who are interested can listen to those events. And as a publisher, you don't really need to know who all your subscribers are. So it makes the decoupling even better. So once again, that's the context maturity model. Now you would, um, in terms of what are we going to do with our entire system? Are we going to go ahead and change all of these down this path? This is a goal, I think, um, basically to the right we d is where we want to eventually end up. There might be a time when we might want to just stop in the third and say, you know, plug in with signals is good enough because um, we don't necessarily, there are, of course, disadvantages to having a separate physical boundary in terms of operationally and whatnot. So in some cases, maybe you want to stop at the third and not necessarily go all the way to the fifth. And then, you know, eventing versus uh, asynchronous communication, there might be some trade-offs as there as well. Um, we're planning to write a lot of this up in, our, in an open edX proposal, uh, so to give you more detail. But here's a, just a quick overview. 
So now for legacy systems, how do we, what are we trying to do? Are we going to try to write everything towards microservices? So not necessarily. So um, one way of thinking about this is like if that red circle there is legacy, then you might want to actually just bridge to the legacy. Like you might want to just publish a new language, a new API layer, and just have an anti-corruption layer that buffers your new stuff with the old stuff. And then new requests that come in, they just go through the, the new API, and the legacy can just remain as is. Why would you want to do that? Well, you know, this is once again a trade-off. If the legacy is not core to your system, then rewriting it may not make sense at this time. If it's a supporting a generic thing, then let's just let it be, because it's just there, it's supporting us. But, you know, having an API so that new stuff can do it the right way, the, right, the new way that we're thinking about domain-driven models and so forth, then, then this allows us to do that. An alternative is to replace the legacy if it's a core part of the system. So for instance, the block store work that we're planning to do with content repository, we may actually want to create this new bounded context, this new way of storing our content, um, and we may want to eventually remove the legacy way of doing that. And so this is another way of thinking about it where the, the new stuff will have its own data storage, right? So compare that to this. Here, the new stuff is really just a interface above the old stuff. And all read write is just basically, you know, the, the, the access is the request just go right through to the old. Whereas here, we want, we can allows us to eventually get rid of the um, the legacy layer, and there could be a data synchronization between the the, the old legacy and the new via an anti-corruption layer. Um, but the new can eventually then replace the old because it will start having its own data storage and, and so forth. So these are just techniques. Domain-driven design talks a lot more about ways of, of doing these. But I just want to give you an, a, a perspective on some ways that we're thinking of moving forward. So we went by this very quickly. Uh, thanks for listening. And um, as uh, if you guys have any questions. Okay, so we have 10 minutes or f five minutes, seven minutes left for, for questions. Uh, and I was just gonna say, um, definitely talk more with us on the architecture Slack channel. We have an architecture team that is now a team of five engineers, uh, plus a, a product manager who is focusing on enabling a lot of this for our platform. So thank you very much. Are there any questions? I know I went by very quickly, but yeah. Go ahead. Well, I, I noticed a lot of the work here is, you know, kind of the scalability and repeatability and customers kind of stuff. So I'm just wondering, are there uh, business models where productivity is very important that you're worried about because when you do the decoupling, it's so much faster that you know, they can see the value of it. So I, from your point of view, Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. And um, so, and this is why, like, th th there's trade-offs will exist, and we'll have to uh, determine which of these types of, uh, you know, places we want to create those boundaries. And if latency is a, a large concern, then maybe, for instance, the logical boundary, like the third context there, with plugins with sig signals might be sufficient. And with microservices, um, you know, yes, there is a, a latency there. But as you can see, like even us, like the reason why we have this movement for front end and back end split is because we are finding that having independently deployable applications is gonna make us, you know, move faster. And so there is an advantage to that. Uh, and so there, there will be, you know, implementation wise, uh, things that we'll need to factor in, in terms of, you know, determining and always monitoring to see, you know, where we can optimize for latency. Yes. Sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no, uh, good question. So the, uh, let me find that. So 
the anti-corruption layer is, is a terminology that, where do I have that? So anti-corruption layer is a terminology that domain-driven design uses. And essentially what it is, is it, it's, it's an abstraction layer that allows you to uh, focus any translations that you want from one context to another. So if, and we, I didn't go into depth here, I, I could talk about this for two hours actually, but like, <laughs> but like you know, in, in domain-driven design you have a bounded context which might have its own ubiquitous language, its own way, its own domain models. And another bounded context that has a different perspective, a different model of things. And the anti-corruption layer allows you to translate from one to another. It allows these contexts to be independent from each other. So one can go and evolve the way that it needs to because that team is starting to function and maybe its mindset, that, that team's way of thinking about things can evolve differently. And so it allows us to you know, have def decoupled ways of independent, independent context. But then there's this one particular layer, and that's the only layer that you need to make sure that the teams communicate with each other. Um, and in bounded context, you'll have also term, uh, terminology such as one is um, you know, a client of the other, or, one, or each are cooperative with each other. And it really then boils down to how the teams communicate with each other as well. Okay, yeah, I'll talk. Um. Oh uh, yeah, so that's a good question. I didn't include, um, uh, so, so the, this one, this has a perspective on what we think is core and what, we is, what, we, what isn't. Um, because of time, I didn't go into the bounded context within each subdomain, but within each subdomain, we do have also defined which parts we think are core. So for instance, taking learning as an example, right? Within learning, there is supporting of learning and social learning and some other things that may not be core right now, uh, but like consuming the learning and the courseware right now is, is, is core. So, um, uh, but anyway, like, I, I can, in, in the Slack channel, send you guys links with uh, wiki pages that we've currently created that have more definitions behind what each subdomain means, what each bounded context means, but eventually they will become open at its proposals and our team will be working on that, making that happen. Yeah. Does this already exist, uh, the architectural principles and dialogue in the lab? It will soon. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's a good question. Uh, the, the new things that we are implementing, we want to start thinking about it from this perspective. And uh, so, for instance, plug in with signals. There's a, you guys have heard of the new completion and progress APIs. And so that was implemented as a separate repo outside of the edX platform. And it uses Django signals, so whenever someone submits a problem, whatever, there's a Django signal that then gets received by the new completion API, and that is, uh, uh, you know, and so it uses that, that, that way of, uh, of keeping things decoupled. Uh, and then there's new work that's happening with uh, thinking about publishing of catalog content and so forth, and you know, we're looking, we're using domain-driven design principles to determine where those, how those relationships are and things like that. So to answer your question, it's the new stuff that we're looking into and, um, and not necessarily rewriting everything at this time, but like the ones, whatever we do choose to replace or add features to and whatnot, we're, we're, we'll be using these principles. So, yeah, okay, okay so yeah, time for maybe one or two questions, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so with architecture, there's uh, process is as important as like technology and other things. And we we are looking at uh, having so because we formed this architecture team, uh, we're actually looking at having architect buddies, so to speak, with other product development teams. So an architect buddy would help uh, you know basically evangelize a lot of these ideas. And we're hoping that over time, 
you know, people do become intentional. Well, intentional. Actually, it's not hoping. We need to. We just, we need to. I mean, it's, we cannot sustain ourselves the way that we are right now. So we need, we need to start doing this. Uh, we're internally right now, yes, we're, we're evangelizing this via, you know, with, via meetings and, and, and talking about this. This is an opportunity for us to talk about this with the OpenEdX community. I hope that in our o open source pull requests as well, we have these conversations. I was just talking to somebody from Fun earlier today, and uh, you know, they're also thinking about boundaries, and they want to be able to plug and play their enterprise application and all that stuff. So, so having those, cause those conversations about what those interfaces should be, there, there's a lot to be done here, and I think in some ways it's exciting because um, it, uh, this type of mindset allows us to have a common framework that we can speak and, 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 and think about how to, how to make, those, make it happen. Yeah, so one last, oh, stop. Okay, we're at time, guys. I don't want you guys to delay to your next session, but um, please come and find me uh, or find anyone on our edX teams. So thank you very much. Django signals?
Morning everyone, can you hear me okay? Yes, thumbs up, yes, brilliant. Okay, um, it's great to see you all. Thank you for coming to join me and Tonio. So this is Tonio, who is advertised as taking the talk. I'm not Tonio, as I hope you'd notice. Um, my name is uh, Philippa and I work with Tonio at uh, Proversity. Um, I am the, the Chief Learning Officer at Proversity. Tonio, what's your official title? I'm the Lead Software Engineer at Proversity. 
Yeah. So we're actually going to uh, work together today to talk a little bit about uh, gamification in learning, as you know, um, but what that means to us at Proversity, how we use um, game design principles to inform um, the design and the delivery of our learning. Um, so, yes, yeah, great to see you. So, um, yeah, one of the things that I, um, so, yeah, as Chief Learning Officer at Proversity, I have um, quite a big team of instructional designers, learning designers, as I refer to them. I kind of interchange those two terms. Um, and one of the things I say most often to my team of designers is that they should be more Mario, which obviously they find hilarious. Um, and by that, probably, I actually mean um, that they should be uh, more Tezuka, Shigeru, and Koji. So these are the three game designers who are behind uh, the huge Mario franchise and, and those, those great um, Mario games. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here is that I encourage my learning design team to, to think and to design like video game designers. So why on earth do I do that? And I guess that's the question that I want to answer uh, today. Um, I'm actually asked that question a lot. Why gamification? I'm challenged on it quite a lot, and I think that's because of the amount of bad press that gamification um, has had, the gamification of learning has had, I think particularly in the higher education sector, which is where I come from um, in the past. So for some um, gamification, and by that I mean the process of applying typical elements of game playing, uh, like point scoring and competitions, and getting prizes for doing well, um, some people think that that does not, should not mix with learning, which is a serious endeavor, something kind of very difficult, in, uh, different in character and culture from learning, that it is actually a distraction from a very serious business. And I think that's true. I think if gamification is just used for novelty, uh, to add something that's different, to attempt to be fun, then often it doesn't work and it doesn't impact. Um, but Critically, um, there is a lot of research to show, and primarily this research comes from a guy called uh, Professor Carl Kapp. Has anyone heard of Professor Carl Kapp? One hand, brilliant. But if you're interested in looking at this further, he is like, uh, yeah, the guru on this. Um, and his research, very in-depth research, long-term research, um, proves, I think, that um, many of the principles of great video game design are the same principles which apply to great learning. Um, and so by follow, my, my basic point here today, I think, is if there's one takeaway, the headline is that by following some of the principles of great game design, we can gr create really great um, learning experiences um, which support effective knowledge and skills development. So. Let me, I think what I'm going to do today is just to kind of run through a few examples of how at Proversity we have used um, video game design, uh, how we've thought about, um, thought as um, game designers to inform um, the learning that we've designed. <clears throat> Primarily, I should say, for adults, so I'm talking here specifically about andragogy. It is the case that we can use gamification for kids too, and I think typically, actually, that's where we use gamification most frequently, but actually, um, there is a lot of potential to use gaming too to really engage and encourage learning amongst adults um, and that's what I'm particularly interested in because that's where we work. So I think first up, um, one of the key gaming principles that we've drawn on at Proversity uh, is active learning. So as much as, as possible, our learning experiences leap straight into the action. So when you launch a video game, uh, there is very little, if any, preamble. So there's no passive watching of like Mario standing up and setting the scene. He doesn't explain in detail like what you're going to do and why you're going to do it and what you'll achieve by the end, what you might do with the things that you learn in the process of the game. There's just typically a really quick text or video introduction which you are very welcome to skip and you're straight into the job at hand. In the gaming scenario then you're a very active character. Um, you have a challenge to complete, um, you set out to do it, you have a go, and by having a go, you learn and you develop, and then you eventually succeed. And at Proversity, we believe that the same is true with really effective um, adult learning. So, research shows that as learners mature, we're talking here about adult learners, as I've said already, um, we see an increasing motivation in them to learn less just for the sake of it, and more to develop knowledge and skills for immediate or near immediate application 
typically to do better in their work. And I think that's something that came out of Fiona's uh, talk yesterday. Um, research also shows that active learning, so just getting on and doing something, um, rather than being told about something in the abstract, leads to faster um, and more embedded cognitive gain uh, when compared with learners who are just kind of told stuff, expected to sit passively and consume content. So a great learning experience then uh, jumps straight into the action as soon as possible. And that's one of the principles that we use at Proversity. So to give you an example, we're currently working with the Cabinet Office in the UK, and we've been challenged by them to design and deliver an online course which um, supports other governments in developing countries to create great um, government campaigns which actually lead to real measurable change. Um, and here we take a very active approach so when you enter the course, you're straight into the action. So there's no preamble to the course. There's no long-winded video or text introduction. Uh, there's no sharing of outcomes at the start of each module. And there's no explanation of the plot and the learning journey. Um, instead, um, there's a focus on immersion, on experience. So when you take this course, um, you're not told about campaigning. You are a campaigner from the word go. Every week, you are the central character. You'll set a campaigning challenge, you complete that challenge, you get feedback on that challenge, you learn from your mistakes, you go again, and that's how we do it. So in this course, like most of our courses, we draw really heavily on that principle of active, experiential, quite immersive learning. And we find that that's a really um, effective way of learning, far more so than the typical approach. Um, hopefully you would agree it's a typical approach, but which is much more kind of text heavy, less emphasis on the doing, more emphasis on being told what stuff is. So quite a passive learning experience. Um, the second gaming lesson, which we sometimes draw upon, thanks Tonio, um, is um, basically learning through failure, which sounds a little bit uh, negative. But again, it's, it's this trying and doing culture. So when you do jump straight into the action, it's really important that you have one, more than one chance to get it right. Um, otherwise, people are just going to switch off and the no learning is going to happen. So in a gaming scenario, you typically get a number of goes, a number of lives, um, and you develop mastery through trial and error, through learning from your mistakes. Um, so a gaming environment then, I guess, is essentially like a safe environment in which you can try things out, fail, try again, until you learn essentially how to make the right decisions um, and how to take the right sort of actions in the context that you're in. And again, the same is true of an effective learning experience. Um, so, yeah, the mastery of a subject, so be that like the development of knowledge and understanding or the development of a set of skills, which increasingly we see as the focus of a lot of ad, um, adult learning courses, um, can be achieved through having a go, reflecting either individually or supported by peers and coaches, and then trying again until your understanding or that skill is mastered. Um, to give you an example of, of how this kind of manifests in our courses, we're currently work, working with HBKU University in Qatar on quite a groundbreaking course on how to implement solar technology in a desert climate. So again, instead of like walking them through, defining what is um, you know, solar power, what does a great solar farm look like, um, we, again, we're very kind of active learning led and we make the most of this trial and error approach. So for example, um, I mean, one, of the, one of the outcomes is that learners need to be able to understand how to identify in their country the best spots within the desert to place solar panels. And the initial proposal from HBKU is that we had like a kind of 40 minute lecture on this and then people did a tick box exercise afterwards, which is not uncommon in terms of people's imagined approach. But we're doing it differently. So what we do is we actually have somebody walk through step by step how you go through this process. Um, we then offer learners 10 potential sites and they have to pick two, the, the, the two, top two or three sites based on the criteria they now understand and provide a rationale as to why those sites. And they, get, they then get uh, feedback and typically they get it wrong first time but that is deliberate. And what, what it means is that they, can, they go through, they make the errors that they might make in real life and through that they have a much richer learning experience. Um, Okay, so another thing that we do, thanks Tonio, um, in terms of drawing on the gaming principles, the third principle is that in a gaming scenario, you typically get to choose a level of mastery or where your starting point is. 
Um, and research shows that typically gamers will select a level that's not too easy, but also not too difficult. So they want to feel a sense of challenge, but they also want to succeed and be able to demonstrate success. Uh, so people like just enough challenge to motivate them. And the same is absolutely true also of learning. So I think one of the things at Proversity that we've noticed is that gaming really encourages to think about this notion of mastery. Where are people starting and where do they want to get to? And can we give them some control over that? Um, Again, just to go back to a little bit of the um, adult learning theory, um, research shows that as a person matures, um, their what we call self-concept uh, moves from one of being a kind of dependent personality um, towards one of being a more kind of self-directed, autonomous human being. So in short, basically, adult learners like to influence as much as possible what they learn based on what they already know and what they can already do. Um, so like with gaming, um, we, when we differentiate learning experiences and so when we give them that choice over what level of challenge they want, um, they typically will engage for longer with a the course. They will push themselves harder. Um, so again, they will kind of maybe, maybe select a level slightly above where they think they are and to get that sense of push. And they will achieve more and are more likely to complete the course than if we dictate where they start. Uh, just a couple of examples to show how we capture this in our learning design. So one is we, we use uh, pre-course diagnostics, which enable learners to rate themselves against certain criteria, and then that then dictates what track that they take within that course. So we might provide two or three tracks, depending on what the different levels of mastery, what the subject matter is. Um, and we've also um, started to use more team-based approaches using the cohorts functionality, which enables people to be grouped by um, different perceived levels of competency, and therefore they kind of travel through the course together and master the same, like, yeah, progress through the same kind of mastery journey, if you like. Um, okay, so the finding game principle, I just want to say something about before I hand over Tonio to talk a little bit more about the technology behind all of this. Um, is about achievement. So, yeah, gaming is a lot about scores and leaderboards and competition. Um, the drivers behind that vary. So, some gamers want to compare themselves to other people and want to be like, you know, the best in class effectively. Um, other people are motivated to engage just to get better themselves internally over time. Um, so, to develop their individual performance. And again, the same is absolutely true of learners. So, to reflect this at Proversity, uh, we do a couple of things. So we provide certification, which I know is not unusual, but, but to increase the motivation and to, to meet the needs of those um, different learner types, we do differentiate our certification to, to better motivate people. So we have certificates for completion, which have a certain rubric, a certain requirement, but we also have um, certificates which, you know, to reflect the fact that people have done the equivalent of completing with honours. Um, also, increasingly we're working with lots of uh, people from industry, people who use our courses for professional development. So we're able to give people special recognition for certain workplace skills, things like leadership and collaboration. And we can reflect that in the certificate. And we can also acknowledge that, recognise that both for learners and for the people who employ the, the, the learners uh, through badging. And um, I think that's telling you where I'm going to hand to you to talk a little bit about how that works. Yeah. Uh, so on OpenEdX, if you want to give like a, any kind of like achievement that is not a certificate, you give badges. By default, they support Badger from Concentric Sky. Uh, the only limitation about the badges on edX is that you can only get them at the end of the course, which sometimes some clients want to be able to acknowledge how they are progressing their learners, like per a submodule or something like that, like after a, an assessment. So for that, we build the Badger X block, which basically lets you embed that X block after an assessment and it will actually read the grade that you get on that assessment. And if you pass the assessment, you will get a badge. So that gives like instant satisfaction to the learner if it actually passed the assessment, instead of waiting all the way after finishing the whole course, which sometimes many students don't yep. finish yep. because of that. Uh, 
Badger uses the Open Badges standard made by Mozilla Foundation, so they can actually share the badges anywhere, like LinkedIn, and it's already enabled on edX using your profile tab. Uh, we use it on one client called KHDA. Those are an examples of the badges that we give. It's like custom badges that we made and you just upload it to your Badger service. Uh, there are two options to get Badger running. You can use the open source Badger server or you can use the hosted Badger by Concentric Sky. And if you wanna check out that Xblock, that's the GitHub repo, Badger Xblock from our Proverty org account. Yeah, so essentially that's it. That's our message. I think um, hopefully we've managed to kind of suggest to you today um, like how gamification, if it's mapped to learning principles, if it is learning first, which is our tagline at Proversity. So if we use gamification as a way of better achieving learning outcomes, it can really help um, to um, make learning active, to make learning um, engaging, to encourage um, iterative mastery of a subject through practice and reflection and then more practice. Um, and it also provides that really critical opportunity, as Tony has just said, to kind of drive, to recognize, and to, to share learner achievement, which, um, yeah, we find is absolutely critical. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, thanks for your time. And if you have any questions, please do let us know. It's more about like just designing the batch and then getting set up that badger server, which can take like a day or less. Or if you don't have like a DevOps guy, just buy the hosted version of badger, which is uh, ready to go, very easy to use. And you can connect very easily to your edX instance following the edX documentation, which can be helpful sometimes or not. <laughs> <laughs> but most of the time it works. It's very easy to set up. It's just in a day or less, you can have badges running. And the Badger X block, it's also very easy to use. Yeah. Yeah, and in terms from the learning, so yeah, sorry, yeah, so from my learning design perspective, um, it doesn't necessarily take me longer to design something that needs to be gamified. It does take me longer to convince the client that it's the right thing to do. Um, and so often, I mean, change management is a huge part of what we do. We often work with, we work with lots of universities, really like uh, University of Oxford, for example, been around for you know, thousands of years. We're coming in and telling them how to teach different. And so that in itself is a massive ask to then suggest that their you know, highly prestigious, world-class knowledge can be gamified is another layer of um, change. I think by mapping it to learning science, we're able to convince them. But certainly, yeah, from my experience, you would need to build in more time at what we refer to as that kind of like analysis, discovery, collaboration phase to make sure that they fully understand why, you know, to link it back to their outcomes, understand fully why we're doing it and what the benefits of it are. As a design process, though, um, it's just a different way of thinking. It's a different way of designing. Um, and it's, not, it's more and less appropriate in different contexts, depending on the outcomes that we're trying to achieve. Skills-based stuff, in particular, lends itself quite nicely to this. But yeah, it is, it is that upfront sell, almost, that can be very challenging. I think we should. I think we should. We could yeah, give points to people for, for accepting it quietly. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. Absolutely, yes. It can. Yeah. So it's really, I mean, we're, we're working on. Yeah, so effectively saying, like, can we use this to better understand analytics, to, 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 to see learner behavior through the use of gamification? Um, I will speak in the abstract, and then, Tonya, you can actually say what's actually achievable. But absolutely, like, the, it, it provides us with an opportunity, potentially, to see who's engaging with what and when. It's a really efficient way of being able to track learner engagement. So we use the badging on a modular basis for motivation because it is, you know, it, it's, not, it's less of a delayed reward. Um, but it also enables us to see how people are progressing through the course, whether they're progressing as we expected them to, and obviously how they're achieving, because if they don't get to a certain level of mastery, then they won't automatically be awarded the badge. <coughs> so there is huge potential here also, yeah, to use gamification as a way of better understanding and then reinforming the design as a result of that. Tony, I'm not sure what and the, the analytics the we have at the moment. An analytics platform. I'm pretty sure we haven't hooked it up the X block to actually store those events, but it shouldn't be that hard. Just connecting it, and then you could get everything on insights. Yeah. Yes. Question. Sorry, yeah. So um, thank you for the question. So just asking, um, we saw that um, some of the badges we use to mark progress through the course. And the question is, like, what else do we use the badges to acknowledge? I think I, I'll answer from Learn Design. I think um, it's about, yeah, it's about knowledge and skills acquisition often. Um, so, for example, with the, uh, the solar stuff that we're doing with HBKU, it's, it's the, it is, you get the badge to acknowledge that you have the skills required at this level, which at this point is like postgraduate level, to be able to identify um, the, the correct location for solar paneling. Um, and so, I, and typically that's what it is, so it, we, can, we can really make it work to anything, I think. Um, Within, so we work a lot with Teach First, um, a teach development uh, charity, and they have a, a huge emphasis on leadership skills. So we can use the badges there to acknowledge that not just are the, are the teachers learning, for example, I don't know how to um, manage classrooms, but also showing through the course that they're developing leadership skills, for example, in how they interact with other people on the course. So we would use it to acknowledge that. So typically it's progression, but it's also skills. And I think what's really valuable is that, that those badges and those recognitions can then be exported, can't they, to um, sites like LinkedIn, for example. So it becomes something that's real and that's really driving your professional development. And on the technical side, uh, right now on edX is you get the badge when you finish the course and you can also set events to get badges like if you enroll in a course or you have enrolled in five courses the badger X block right now you only get badges for assessments that's the only type of event that we support but we plan to support more events like uh, you have watched 80% of the videos good stuff like that, but that's something that we need to work on it. Yeah. Or someone else can work on it because I know it's, it's open source. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, typically it's progression and completion, so it kind of gives a sense of like monitoring and motivation, but it is also about acknowledging your mastery through, through the course, the mastery of knowledge and skills, yeah. Yes. Sure, so, so that does happen a lot. Um, it's happening as we speak with the University of Oxford, but they are very open to the idea. I think the challenge that we always get is prove to me why, and I always refer back to the learning science. So for example, it's well, evidence shows 
the adults trying to, adults, that's who we're talking about, trying to develop skills, that's what we're trying to do, in this very technical area, for example, learn best through doing it and trying it. And I can, I can provide 10, 20, 30 articles backed by research to show that that's the case. And so it's kind of almost talking their language. It's saying, you know, they're used to working in an evidence-based way. Here's the evidence to show that this is the best way to do it. I think what we don't do at ProVersity, I guess, is just move existing content online. We don't digitize it. And, we, you know, we don't, yeah. It's not just a different means of delivery. It's actually what we bring is that learning design knowledge. And so we set that out very clearly at, at, the, at the contracting stage with clients that, it will be more than just that. And so there's an expectation that we're not just going to ask for the handouts and the slides and maybe make some videos, that actually there's going to be what we refer to as a discovery phase, where a learning strategist will sit down with the client for anything from three days to two weeks to a month to really explore what the learning outcomes are. Um, and then from there, we use our expertise in curriculum and content design to identify, OK, so in order to meet those outcomes, in this, in this online context or in this blended context, whatever the context is in this case, we need this content and we need these activities. And I then present, or a learning strategist then presents that back, again, with reference to the research. And so it can be challenging and it does take time, but most people are, well, everybody is convinced by it. And we also, like, you know, we're very clear that we only go with the best design for your learners, and this is what we're ultimately trying to achieve. So it really helps to keep drawing it back to the learners and to their strategic and business goals too, and say, well, this is actually the most effective way of doing it, and it, and it will work. So I guess it's just, yeah, it's important to acknowledge that there is a big change management piece in there, but also there's a lot of enthusiasm for it. I mean, these are typically people who are really into learning and development anyway, so they're just excited. And I think part of what we offer is how we work with our clients is that we help to upskill them a little bit in this, in the hope that maybe they can then take it forward themselves in the future. So they're actually really open to, to new ideas and to this process that we go through. <coughs> yeah, it's effectively coaching as well as design, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I th I, yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it has some value. It's a sliding scale. I think it ha can have value for everything. So a hard skill, I would design in a very, like, if, if the outcome is that you need to develop a hard skill compared with, um, I don't know, a leadership skill, then the learning journey will look very different. Um, so for example, yeah, with a technical skill, there's going to be more content, inevitably. Um, there's going to be like motion graphics. There's going to be different deliverables and, and, and different ways of learning. But gamification can still be used as a way to motivate people through that content um, to identify when they have achieved a level of mastery. So I think there's always space for it. We just use it in different ways. Um, the softer stuff, we use the badging to kind of identify that, for example, yeah, you have shown leadership there, you have shown collaboration there. The harder stuff, we would use it more to push people through the content. Um, but I would make the argument that actually there is, it's always applicable, um, just in different ways. So yes, yeah, so I mean, it's not data that we've generated, but I could absolutely share with you, yeah, to show um, the difference that it makes in terms of. Um, Engagement throughout the course, so you're less likely to just like mass load all the learning at the end, um, and course completion um, has significant impact, yeah. And I'd be happy to, to share that afterwards. Okay? Good. Mm. Yeah, so we really we set a really high bar for a start, and we have that for all of our, so we don't really do like noddy quizzes and this kind of thing, so we make it difficult, and that seems to be enough. So also it's about like getting the frequency of it right, and you don't wanna, you know, 
we do, we kind of, I like to try and keep it to kind of one badge per module, so it's like one thing per week that you can be awarded for. But I think the answer is keep the bar really high, really push people. Um, like I was saying before, um, with the example of HPKU, like make it so hard that they will fail and that really motivates them to continue. But you're right, you know, there is a risk here that if we just badge everything all the time, then it will lose its value. And there is a temptation to do that because interactivity and getting feedback on your learning is, pr is kind of proven to motivate that learning. But again, you just need to get the balance right. So yeah, we, once a week badge, but like super difficult to achieve it. No, no, and it, and, and it is, it's a, it's a huge challenge. It's like the equivalent of saying, well, you need to show your workings out to make sure that you've got to the right conclusion before we give you a badge and tell you, yeah, brilliant, well done. I think what we do at Proversity is we, we typically take a scaled, blended approach. So in, in courses where it requires um, a human eye to, to check that, we, that's, we, we do that. So we always encourage our clients to commit as much resource as possible to providing teaching assistants and coaches and that kind of thing to review activity on a weekly basis just to make sure that we're not just focusing on the outcomes but also on the, the processes that sit behind this and I think that's something to acknowledge is that badging is both a solution in that it can be automated and therefore provide like fill a gap in feedback but actually that there is still a need for qualitative feedback and for the monitoring of of the results, if you like. And so actually sometimes we find that our clients want to do badging manually, which is like the ultimate blended approach. So they might, in hindsight, apply badges based on not just the result that they get, but how they've done it, how much value they've added to a discussion and this kind of thing. So we use them in different ways, but in something where the working out is critical or the process of learning leading up to the outcome is critical, then we have additional interventions that happen to monitor that too. Yeah, so it's all about like, so the discovery phase is, um, so it's an inductive model, which means basically we ask lots of questions. So we don't have like a one size fits all. And it's who are your learners? Yeah, how much teacher and coach support input can we have? Uh, do you have physical spaces where you want people to get together? Do you want asynchronous? Do you want some live stuff but that's virtual? Is it important to connect people globally? All of these massive... So we run through all of this and what we end up with is like this mass of information from which we can then concoct the best possible design out of who we're trying to reach, what we're trying to teach and like how much budget there is ultimately um, as well. So yeah, it all comes through that discovery phase and I think that is arguably the most critical bit that we do. That's why we do it face to face. And that's why we can like put so much time into it because it's so important to get that right because it then sets the trajectory for, for everything else. We're done? Okay. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Well done, well done.
Hmm ok, tu, tu devais pas présenter ou... Oh oui, ouais. <rire> Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is Xavier Antovuk, and he is going to be showing keeping maintenance under control, contribute all the changes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Uh, so uh, today we are going to talk about maintenance. So maintenance, when you hear it, uh, the like that sounds a little bit boring. Why should you care about maintenance? <laughs> Uh, well, uh, to, to try to explain that, I'll uh, walk you through uh, more or less uh, a pattern that you've, we have seen with a number of clients and projects using OpenEdX, uh, how they come to realize that maintenance is actually something important to, to care about. Uh, so just walking you through the different steps. So the, the first contact that most people have with OpenEdX as an open source project is great. It's a great gift. Uh, we get all that code for free, millions of dollars spent on it, and it's all for us, which is great. So this part, so far, so good. Then, obviously, uh, we start needing to add some features. It's missing this there. The teachers are asking for that, and we need it now. So then we want to develop those features, and it's great because it's open source, so we can do it. Uh, but it's open source, we might have heard somewhere that on open source project people contribute things, but everyone has a schedule. Um, and uh, when the question of whether to contribute back, the change comes up, often there is not that much time for it. So um, we like, and actually if some organization go even a little bit further, this is not a charity, we don't have time to spend on this kind of things. Um, some still try it, uh, and one of the comments they give, but I tried, I submitted it, they refused my pull requests. So I did my part, sorry, they don't want it. Uh, there are various reasons for that. The quality standards of the project are fairly high, uh, so if you've developed features in a quick and dirty way, there's no way that's going to get into the, the code, and I'm glad for that, because that means that otherwise the code quality of what we would be getting from OpenEdX would be uh, lower. Uh, the technical approach might not fit the project. Uh, the design might not be generic enough. Uh, lots of different reasons why that might not happen if you just like send it uh, for uh, contribution at that point and in a quick way. So often the reaction at that point will be, mm, you don't want it, that's fine. I'm just going to keep it for myself. That's mine, that's my feature. Um, and why would I care, actually? Like, that's better. Like, if I'm a vendor or, I don't know, university project, I have no unique feature that nobody else has. That's supposedly a good thing. Um, just a side note on this. Uh, even if you don't contribute back a uh, contribution uh, or a change that you make to the platform, it's still HGPL v3 for most of the platform. So you need to at least uh, publish the code somewhere, even if you don't open a pull request against the main platform. Link to your code, uh, mention that it's AGPL, uh, and that it's OpenEdX. It's just part of the license. If you don't do that, you lose the right to use OpenEdX. Um, so until now, the feature is just ours. That's great. All goes well until the next release comes in. So then that's usually the first contact that most organizations get with the problem that I'm talking about here, is what do we do here? Because we have uh, our OpenEdX version with the previous stable version, our change on top of it. Uh, but the new version that comes in doesn't have that change. So we could just upgrade to the new version, get the, that new version, but then we lose that feature. We could keep the old version, but then we don't get all the nice new features from OpenEdX 
that have been developed in the meantime. So often what that leads to is that you get to the new version and you reapply the change that you've made to the previous version. Uh, except that since in the meantime the platform changed, uh, maybe the architecture was a little bit different, uh, UI and etc. So it means that what you developed previously doesn't completely apply well to the new version. So it means you have work to do to reapply it to, and in some cases redevelop the feature because the ground will have changed just below you. Uh, and this, by the way, includes change that you would do in a theme, because I know a lot of people do like put features in themes. It's okay because it's a theme, so then, then I don't have to do it. That's the same, you still have to, to handle that. Uh, and this is true for one release, but this is true forever. Every single release of OpenEdX, you will have to do that. And actually, you're not going to stop developing features, you're going to add some, so that problem is going to get worse. Uh, and usually by the time you've upgraded, the next release is around the corner, and you pile up a larger and larger amount of work every release forever. Uh, then, obviously, you have that amount of work uh, at each release, which is kind of a nightmare, to be honest. Like, as a developer, that's one of the least uh, nice uh, type of task that you can have to deal with. Uh, not only uh, you don't develop new features, there is nothing new and shiny to, to take care of, but you're digging into old code that has various level of quality. Sometimes the people that wrote that feature are not around anymore, so nobody understands that mess. And nobody wants to deal with that, so that gets given to maybe junior developers who, like, because they, they just arrived, they don't know better, they say, oh, okay, I'll do that. and then end up with kind of a nightmare on their, on their hands. Uh, and that doesn't help the quality of the work that is being done, meaning that uh, the changes progressively, one release after the next, will get a little bit more messy and accumulate some entropy, uh, and that will actually compound. You don't just add linearly a number of features, but it's more something that looks like an exponential. Uh, you will get more and more difficulty each release to, uh, to do your change. So that means that it looks like this. Um, the, at the very beginning, it doesn't sound like much of a problem. Okay, it's meant half a day to upgrade or a day or something like that because you don't have that many features. But the, uh, the, the characteristic of an exponential curve is that at the beginning, what feels very really slow and gradual at some point it feels very sudden because we are not equipped uh, to really relate with the exponentials. Uh, so for a long time it doesn't seem like a problem until it, uh, it's actually almost too late to do something at least in a simple way uh, for that. Uh, and that's also a reason why we give that advice to almost every single new project that we hear of, whether they are clients or not. And it's often ignored. And that's part of the reason why. Because at the beginning it doesn't look like a problem. So if you don't have in the team, and especially at the managerial level, someone who went through that before, uh, who felt that pain of that curve that suddenly really increased, usually it's like, okay, we have enough to take care of for now, we'll see about that later. But when you get to that uh, really increase, then it's really uh, the panic button, because suddenly everything explodes, a large part of your development budget goes into uh, uh, rebasing, upgrading. There are like uh, some projects, and not just one, where every single release, that will be a team of like four, five, six people for several months, just working on coping up and making sure that you can still do something about it. Um, so, one thing to know, though, is that if at that point it becomes really difficult and costly to escape, there, there is kind of a, a way to go uh, and come back to something a little bit more sane, and that's, that's what I'm going to be discussing. So if we go back to the reasons for that situation, I think it boils down to a uh, misconception about open source, and especially the 
the, the, the part about the zero cost of uh, operating and developing on an, uh, an open source project. Because like, like I was giving in my first slide, it looks like a nice gift. Um, you, uh, you get all of that code for free. And like a lot of people aren't really used to deal with open source software, so like we tend to uh, relate to it in analogies with things that we already know. And most people know development through uh, maybe custom in-house development where you're the only one, you do whatever you want with your code, uh, you have all the time that you want, you can make all the change, it's not going to impact others and nothing that anyone else does is, um, is, uh, is influencing you. But in the case of open source and open index in particular, it's not at all that. It's that. It means you're one developer among many others. And you need to take that into account when you do the, the, the development. Uh, you're joining a, a community of developers and, and actually that's a good thing because if you were trying to match the number of developers that work on OpenEdX every day, uh, and we're trying to have that in ours, like, like okay, let's hire 100 developers and I don't need to care about this. Even then, um, which would be already silly in the first place, but even then you would, there would probably be features in the main version of OpenEdX that you might want also. Um, and so at the end, whether you want it or not, and that's the important part, you're joining a community and you're going to be impacted by what other people are doing. And as a, matter, as a matter of fact, we are aware of this during when there is a new release, but this happens all the time, like OpenEdX is changing right now. Um, like if you go to master right now, there will be commits of people who have been doing that and you have that every day. So if you wait to think about this for the next release, you will have quite a backlog of things to take into account and that's part of the nightmare. Uh, just an aside right now, because I'm going to use that term a few times about upstream, downstream. So I could just say about contribution that we contribute to edX, but actually there is a more general concept <laughs> about contributions that you take in so, um, developments made by others. So upstream, someone creates something that comes, that trickles down to you. Uh, you might use it, you might change it, and etc. And maybe someone will reuse what you did and go downstream to someone else's project. So basically what I'm saying in this talk is that it's not sufficient to just be sitting next to the river and waiting for whatever. It's better to take a little bit into account what happens upstream to, because that's going to influence you uh, later on. So, the, there are a few perks to contributing uh, because we often talk about the costs of contributing, that it's effort, things that you, you have to do that maybe you don't always want to or have the time for. But there are quite a few things that are really interesting uh, and just for yourself to be contributing. Well, first, it will be much easier to avoid duplicate work. Uh, whenever you will be doing a contribution, you will be talking with people who deal with the platform every day, the, the upstream reviewers. You will be actually looking at the main version of OpenEdX, so you will have the latest development and not the things from six months ago. So you might discover that some other people have already worked on some of the elements that you're looking for. Or maybe they have done some of the parts, or they are working on it right now, and you can influence the development by reviewing their pull requests all things that will gain you time rather than you develop in your corner and next release, surprise, there is another feature that does exactly the same thing and you've just lost time and now you have to run after the new feature. Uh, second thing, it's related to what I was saying before, uh, you can avoid the maintenance hell I was describing this way. Because what that means when you contribute to features is, is that your code becomes part of the official version of OpenEdX. So that means that anyone who will be working on OpenEdX, whether it's people at edX or the contributors like that community of developers, 
will have to take into account your changes. Uh, and you, you also get uh, tools to prevent other people from breaking what you're doing. You can add tests to, the, to, to, to your pull request or to the platform or specific to your use case uh, that will fail if someone breaks your feature. So instead of discovering at the next release that everything is broken, that will be that little red cross that you see that a developer will see uh, while trying to work on this feature. And that's the moment where the person working on that feature will actually take into account your work and make sure that it doesn't break. So one thing to keep in mind uh, is that it, to avoid that, of course, you need to work for it. Like it takes a lot of effort to get a pull request merge upstream. I think um, that's news for nobody. Uh, we hear enough complaints about that, about how difficult it is to merge. But um, if you plan for it from the beginning, uh, it's actually really worth it, even if it takes that much time. Like uh, basically, on average, you need to plan for maybe 30, 50% of your time, uh, like working on addressing upstream uh, requests or conforming to the project standards and etc. And and in terms of budget, like if you if you want to do a clean feature that is upstream, that might take you several times, like I don't know, two, five, six times more uh, the, the the time budget that you would have needed to just do the quick and dirty just to satisfy someone and let's forget about it. But the thing is that as we saw before. Uh, the, even if you go faster at first, you will have every release work to do to be able uh, to keep your feature in the platform and keep the upgrades at the same time. So you will end up spending that time, like no matter what, you don't have, really have a choice at the end. It's just that you have the choice whether to spend it up front and spend that time having a really high quality feature that is in the platform, that is are generic enough to be useful for the community in general and not just your UX case. Uh, and uh, be kind of proud that it's in edX. Or you can spend it over years, uh, sweating tears of blood every time there is a, a rebase. Your choice. Um, another aspect that is interesting is that by contributing, you also get contributions because th that code becomes part of the official release, meaning that other people will get it with their new release. That's part of that little one that appears, the new release there, and your contribution is part of that. So some people will start using it, and they might notice that, oh, that's interesting, but there is that additional feature that could be nice to add on top of that, or I need that for my workflow. So they might also do the same. And if you keep your contribution on your fork, on your own code base, there's very little chance that someone will come and pick that and start using that. It will be difficult to get contributions on that. If it's part of the uh, official project, you will naturally get them. And actually from other contributors, from edX, or from lots of different sources. So that's also a source of not only satisfaction, but cost reduction. Um, also, something that is often really overlooked is that is how much quality this adds to your development to do things upstream. Uh, like, th there are people, actually some of them present in this room, that are just amazing at OpenEdX, at architecture in general, at, and it's people that, even if you had a very good budget, you would probably not be able to afford them or to attract them to your project. But because you contribute your work upstream and you make that effort to make it useful to others, they will spend time looking at it and trying to make sure that it's going to be good. So the level of advice and a review that you get there is just unparalleled. Um, there are very few companies that will be able to match the quality of what you produce at that point because of that, because it will be the the, at the quality standard of OpenEdX in general. Um, and by the way, this is true for uh, code, but you also get product review, UI, depending on your, on your feature, like um, the review will make sure that at all levels, your feature will be matching the, the, the project standards quality level. 
And another one that is important, ah, it's less the type of things that appears at the bottom line on the financial sheets, but I would say at a more personal or emotional level, um, you get that warm, fuzzy feeling that comes from being able to contribute something to others. So it means that when you work, you don't work just for your client or your boss or the stakeholders of your school around you and etc. You work actually for the whole OpenEdX project, for the whole community. And because of the scope of OpenEdX, which works to improve education in the world, you kind of work to help humankind. It's, I know it sounds a little bit over the top, but that, that's actually true. I mean, talking from a personal level, uh, being in that paradigm for the last five years that has been one of the best things in my life. I mean, like I, it's very rare that I end the day not being really happy to be there. Like some days are really like that, but still I have that at the end of the day that this was useful. And I don't think I've been as happy working on something as I have been on OpenEdX because of that, because it's more than just a little project. It's something bigger than ourselves. Anyway, that's, that's probably not what you can use to convince your investors or et cetera, but for yourself, it's also nice to have it. So now, how, how do you contribute? That's also a tricky one. A lot of people have tried and, and have had difficulties with that. Uh, like, the very first thing is to really start small. Uh, like, be aware that you are joining a community. It's not just something technical. So you want to learn a little bit the ropes of it. It's like if you arrive in a party and start like jumping on the table and dancing and kissing everyone, maybe that's too much. Maybe in first you need to see how things are going. Uh, and starting small with just a very small change is going to teach you that because then you see what's the contribution process, what's expected of me, how long do I have to wait, and etc. So I would suggest starting with that. Uh, also, there is like there is um, a certain amount of um, relationship building that you need to do. Because if you come and arrive immediately with 10,000 lines of code of something that is like a little bit weird compared to the, the current standard of the project, maybe the reviewers will be, oh, I'm not sure this is worth my time. If you start small and show that you can get stuff merged, that the time invested by people will be reviewing your task is actually well invested because at the end it benefits the platform, progressively you'll be able to uh, have more attention and people will feel more confident spending time on your work because they know that at the end it will be useful. Um, another point that's really important and that starts at the product phase is to make sure that your work is useful to, you, to others. Again, coming from the, the the, the proprietary world and etc. we are used to just like satisfy a very corner case. Some crazy stakeholder decided that the button needed to be pink and doesn't want to budge. Like you have to deal with that. But because here you're in a community, that won't, that won't go. You need to make sure that whatever you do is as useful as possible to others. So that, that can add a little bit of work, but that will also make uh, your work and your features more consistent over the long term, you will have less uh, blue bee, blue girl, different things that vaguely work and resemble open edX, you will have something consistent. Um, another point is to make sure you get buy-in early from the reviewers, from upstream. So starting a discussion early, um, um, sharing design documents, basically talking before coding. That's really something important, especially the bigger the feature is, the more important that becomes. Because even small things uh, that you overlook at first, you don't know that there is a re an architecture change being done at the moment and the way of doing things is a little bit different or that you need to do, uh, your, place your code in a specific area or in a certain way. Um, this is easy to correct if you know it from the start. If you have already completely developed your feature by the time a stream sees it, then probably that will be a lot of work 
to rewrite it. And um, also, that means that you might become more resistant to the suggestions that are made to you. Because you, you code it, we're all like that. Like, we like our code. We, even if we try to not be too attached to it, we tend to think very quickly that's the best code in the world. So if someone tells you, no, that sucks, then we don't really want to change it. And that happens all the time in a lot of pull requests, and it's really a factor of a lot of them being refused. So yeah, make sure you do that early. You, it will be easier to sit on your ego there. Um, and also, don't be shy. Like, feel free to ask questions. Or, like, I mean, reviewers don't bite. So if you're not sure about something, it's better to discuss it at that point. Follow the best practice. So a few links. You get it from like when you open a pull request or in the OpenEdX uh, um, uh, documentation repositories. Have a look at that. Make sure that you're aware of the different type of uh, standard that you need to follow. Um, plan properly is also really important because well, we all hear about the fact that it takes a long time to get pull requests merged and etc. Um, you need to make sure that you take that into account in your process, that uh, you will have the time not only to go through the, the upstream process, but also to have the time to just address the comments from upstream. If, if your planning stops at the moment where you open the pull request, most likely it won't be accepted because there will likely be at least a little bit of work to do. Uh, and also, you, you, like, you don't necessarily need to wait for everything to be approved and merged and etc. to use the feature because it's always the same thing. We have clients, they have deadlines. We can't wait six months to merge something. So you, you can also deploy the changes that you've made before they are merged in the main repository. It's just that you need to be careful about that. You need to make sure that by the time that you deploy that change, you have a very good understanding of what will still need to change, so the agreement with upstream. You will also uh, need to have had that discussion before. If you followed the, the approach of starting to discuss before coding, that shouldn't be too much of a problem, but that's even more important once you deploy things in production, because not only you might have re to rewrite things, but you might also have to update the data of your users on your platform if you have to change a lot of things, and that can become really complicated. So yeah, just be careful about that. Budget properly also, uh, because again, it takes time to get that stuff merged. Uh, it takes um, uh, quality. Uh, quality takes time also by itself. So it means that if you have someone to which you need to report your time, which most of us do, uh, you need to make sure that whether your boss or your clients or etc. are aware of the time that you will need to spend on that, which will be bigger than if you were just doing it on the side. And this is important to take into account because at the moment where you will be asked to do change on your pull request, you need to have that time. So you need the support of the people who can say, no, you can't work on that, go work on something else. So if you forget about that and leave it for later, that's going to bite you. Uh, the good thing is that it's actually in the interest of the person approving the budgets to say yes and to plan for that. Because like we saw earlier, if you don't, that will still have to be paid, but will be paid later with interest, every release, and etc. So make sure that they are aware of that. Maybe give them a, a link to this talk or, or try to talk about this uh, to, to make sure that they understand the, the drawbacks and advantages of, of the different approaches. Um, also, something that I mentioned before is to work against master. So to work on the current development version of OpenEdX and not like the current stable version, because if you contribute something upstream, that will be against the current development version that you will do. And it's only once it's right over there, it's usually easier to backport that work to the current version that you're using. Uh, because most of the change and discussion will be around that development version. And in any case, the review, the upstream review, will only happen against the development version. So you better start with that. Um, start the review early. Same thing as discussing early. It's still the same principle. Uh, like if you're not sure if it's a big pull request, 
uh, open it early, say that it's a work in progress, and uh, to, to maybe start having some opinions. If you're not sure, it's the same thing, same, always same principle. The earliest, the easiest it is to change, and the less attached you'll be to, to the code. Be responsive to reviews is also something really important. Uh, because like, un until it is merged, the problem of maintenance still applies. You still have to maintain that feature. And actually, um, during the review, you will have to rebase regularly your um, pull request to make sure to follow the, 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 the master. Uh, so until it's merged, it's, it's going to be a pain for you. So it, it's in your interest to answer early or quickly to make sure that that moves forward. It, and it also, on the other side, if you take a long time to reply, it means that the, the, the reviewer on the other side will be, okay, that takes forever and will also take more time to reply. So the thing is with maintenance L is that it's something that happens to a lot of people with, with all the good intentions uh, at first. Uh, and it's, it's not the end of the world if that happens to you. It's still possible to, to recover from it. You just need to be aware uh, of, the, of the fact that it's not something small. And the bigger the work you have done on top of the platform, the bigger work you will have to get back to something clean and a more vanilla version of OpenEdX. Uh, so I won't give all the details. If you're in that situation, don't hesitate to come talk to me after the talk or et cetera, we can discuss it. There are lots of different approach, but mainly the approach is to uh, first stop the bleeding by adopting uh, an upstream first approach uh, for uh, your development from that point on uh, moving forward so that you don't make the problem worse and to progressively reduce uh, the code drift and the depth, the things that are not contributed upstream by contributing them. That will likely mean a lot of rewrite and a lot of work, but on the long term, you'll be glad you did this. So that's it. Uh, so if you have any question or if you need any help with that, I will be happy to answer you. Thank you. <laughs> any questions? Mm -hmm. so yeah. I can reach out to people for product review and then for uh, engineering review and then things usually go well. Mm -hmm. But usually it doesn't go the other way around. So I don't get to, for example, to ask, or like as a community, we don't get to usually ask about features that edX is like, or upstream is, 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 is uh, like adding. So mm, that, that might depend on the feature. Because, well, it, it's true that we don't get asked about every single feature, but for example, if there is an area of the platform that you've contributed a lot to, people will start becoming aware of that. And that happens actually quite frequently that because we worked on some part of the platform, during the review, we get pinged, like, can you have a look at that too? Because at the end, if you've worked a lot on a part of the code, you will become the most knowledgeable person or group for that part of the code. So then anything that will touch it, people might start to remember that. And the more you contribute, the more that effect increase. And for more general features and change, you have like the OEP process, which is actually being extended to, to try to, like everything that can impact people on a large level is supposed not to, to go through that. Uh, sometimes it can be uh, on the, on the mailing list or on different channels. Uh, most of the design documents for new features are actually public on Atlassian and et cetera, on, on the confluence, I mean. Uh, so it's true that sometimes it can be a bit messy. Without a roadmap, it's difficult to know, to pay attention to things. So I agree um, for some part of what you said, but, but if you pay attention and if you contribute a lot and if you actually uh, build those relationships, you might actually hear more about those. And I didn't repeat the question originally, but the question was that uh, we don't necessarily, like it's, it, can be a, it can feel a little bit uh, like one, uh, going one way, where we talk a lot about our development to upstream to edX, but it doesn't always come the other way. Any other question? 
No. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day.